guys. So today's lesson is about monitoring the concentration of ions in samples. And what we'll be looking at today is a technique called atomic absorption spectroscopy and its applications. So atomic absorption spectroscopy is kind of a mouthful, so I'll be using AAS from now on. And this picture is just one of the types of machines that can be used for AAS. So AAS was developed in the 1950s by a guy called Sir Alan Walsh. Uh, that's a picture of him over there. And he was working at the CSIRO in Sydney with a group of his colleagues to develop this technique. Uh, this technique is really important because it can detect concentrations of ions and molecules at really low levels, uh, but with also great accuracy, which was not available at the time and it's used to dete uh, detect and measure the concentrations in samples. Uh, so really it's only used for metal ions. So this is an ex uh, a layout of how it works and we'll just quickly go through that. Uh, so first of all, a hollow cathode lamp is uh, used to emit light, which can then be passed through a sample which has to be atomized because liquids and solids don't pass have light passed through them. So we have to atomize it light passes through this and into the monochromator and then we can then detect it with the detector. Uh, usually the absorption is quite low so we have to amplify the signal and then we can then get the absorption as a readout. Uh, this technique is a really sensitive technique and it is used to measure the concentrations of ions in the sample down to parts per billion. So different metals vaporized in this machine can then uh, be used to absorb light and we can look at this light that's absorbed to determine how much is in the sample. Um, what's important is that each metal ion will absorb uh, specific frequencies. So in an absorption spectrum, which is white light, it has all the frequencies of light in there and each ion will uh, absorb uh, specific frequencies in this spectrum. So in this case it's here, here, here and all the way over there with the black lines and this is specific for the ion we're looking for. Um, if we're going to look at another one it will have different spots where the absorption is occurring. So hollow cathode lamps emit light of specific frequencies like I said and it's specific for the metal we're looking for. So if we're going to look at one metal it will have black bands at certain points and if we have another one the point the black bars will be different spots. Um, what we need to take note of is that the cathode ray, uh, hollow cathode lamp is specific for the metal iron we're looking for and it's also made of that metal. So light is absorbed by atoms in the sample and then we can determine from what is absorbed in the, uh, in the absorption spectrum and determine what ions are there. So in a periodic table we can only really look at metal ions using this technique and we've just highlighted the ones in blue which we can use AES for. Uh, just take note that we'll be focusing on say lead, mercury and zinc in this lesson. Um, these are important to look at because uh, lead and mercury are toxic in the human body, but zinc is really, really essential for living. So the hollow cathode lamp, that's a picture of one over there, is used to measure the concentrations of uh, metal in a sample, and it's specific for the type of metal we're looking for. Uh, so if we're going to have look at, say, copper, we need to have a, a lamp that is made out of copper. If we're going to use uh, a lamp that's made out of zinc, that means we must look for zinc in the sample, not the other way. So when we're going to test the sample, we first have to make up a series of uh, diluted standard solutions, uh, which we then analyze separately. Uh, we, in these solutions, we know the concentration of ions in there, so then we can determine how much absorption is equivalent to how much is in the sample. So first we spray it into the burner and then light from the hollow cathode lamp is passed through it 
and the sample then can absorb the light at the specific frequencies we want. The degree of light absorbed is proportional to the concentration of the metal ions in the sample. So the photo photomultiplier tube is used to detect the amount of absorption uh, in the sample. So that's a picture of one over there. And we can then compare this to a control. So a control will have no atoms of the element we're looking for, which will give us a uh, readout of zero. And then when we put in the sample with the ions we're looking for, then we we'll, can get the difference between the two. So again, the degree of absorption of light absorbance, or denoted as A, is then determined automatically. So the solution of the sample we want to look at is sprayed into the flame of the burner after all this. And then we can look at the intensity of light absorbed, and then we can look at how much of the sample uh, has the ions we're looking for. So as we said, we first had to uh, make up a set of standard solutions of known concentrations and then look at analyze them each separately in the AAS machine. So each we can then plot on a graph of absorbance and the concentration of metal ions. Uh, say at, uh, at this concentration we get this amount of absorbance, at this concentration we get this amount of absorbance, and at this concentration here we're going to get this amount of absorbance. And then we can make a calibration curve based on that. So then when we analyze the sample after that, we don't know how much is in the sample, but we do know the absorbance. So if we know the absorbance is here, we can follow it across to the curve and drop it down and then get the amount of ions in the sample by using our calibration curve. So this is important in a variety of techniques where we don't know the concentration in a curve, uh, in the sample, sorry. So species in the sample are converted into bases, which is what we did just then. So light of a frequency is that we know to be absorbed by the metal is that means we know that that's specific for that ion. So if we pass through white light into a sample, uh, the sample contains certain ions that we're looking for. It will absorb this light and only pass out the rest of it. So we can then get a readout of how much absorbance is in there. So in this case, white light is passed through the sample and because it's absorbing some of the light, what we get uh, coming out of the sample is blue light because it's not all of the frequencies anymore. So light of a frequency known to be absorbed by the metal ion passes through the light source uh, through the heated sample which we're looking at. Ions in the sample can then absorb this light and the amount of absorption is proportional to the concentration of ions in the sample. Uh, the instrument must be calibrated for each metal ion being tested. So if we're going to look for copper, we need to make sure we calibrate the machine for copper. If we're going to then change it to zinc, we need to then calibrate it for zinc before analyzing the sample. Otherwise, it won't work. So separate light sources uh, must be used for each metal ion because it's specific for that ion. So if we're going to look at copper, we need to make sure that the light source is a copper light source, not a zinc one. So before the development of AAS, it was really difficult for scientists to look at how much ions were in a sample really accurately. Uh, so we couldn't look at micronutrients in plants and animals or trace elements because the techniques that we had at the time were not sensitive enough. So we only had chemical techniques before 1950 and these were not sensitive so we couldn't look at um, concentrations in the range of 1 to 100 parts per million. Uh, so AAS is important because it allows us to determine the levels of micronutrients in, say, plants and animals, and essential trace, essential trace elements in the soil and living things. Uh, we can look at deficiencies of essential trace elements in our diets to 
make uh, a diagnosis of any severe health problems that have occurred. Uh, so we look at blood and urine tests and this can quickly give us a readout of how much uh, trace elements we have in our bodies at the time. So trace elements are really important in the body because they help with enzymes, they help with energy production and they're just really required for a lot of cell metabolism. And about 15 trace elements are essential for animal life. For example, we have manganese, copper and zinc. So we'll look at a few examples. So zinc is really important for the metabolism of amino acids in the body. And it's also really important in energy production. So it's used to make glucose in the body. Uh, manganese is really also really important and it's important in blood clotting. So if we cut yourself and we don't have the clotting factors and manganese, we'll just keep bleeding. Um, it's also involved in carbohydrate and fat metabolism, which is also another way to produce glucose. Copper is needed for the production of enzymes and enzymes are how the body works to convert, say, uh, fat to glucose and it's also involved in oxidation reactions, which is pretty much your breathing. Um, other than that, AAS can be used in monitoring the concentration of heavy metals in, say, the soil and in polluted water. Um, they're also the levels in the food. Metals such as mercury, lead and cadmium are toxic to the body, so we'd really need to look at how much is in the, in the water and in our food. So if we have too much in our food and water and we consume it, this could lead to really, really bad health problems. So for example, seafood such as oysters filter the water and that's how they get their food. Uh, but also if there's a lot of heavy metal ions in there, uh, because they're filtering all this water, they can accumulate it in their body. And if we eat them, then we'll eat all those heavy metal ions. So higher order consumers, such as us or larger fish, um, will accumulate heavy metals if we are exposed and eat too much of them. So fish, for example, cannot contain more than 0.5 parts per million of mercury in them. And if we look at how much mercury is in the fish, uh, we can then decide whether it's okay to eat or not. So the analysis is also a, a way for us to look at pollution in the waterways. So in summary, today what we looked at is the AAS uh, technique and how it was developed by Sir Alan Walsh in 1950. And what we're looking at is using it to determine trace elements and micronutrients and also um, the concentration of metal ions in samples uh, with high accuracy but at very looking at very low concentrations and we this has a variety of applications which we just went through so we can look at say how much toxic uh, lead is in say food uh, we can look at how polluted the water is and we can look at whether people are sick or not because they have a deficiency in trace elements. So now we can go on to some questions. So question one, which statement about AAS is correct? So A, AAS is an effective qualitative technique but cannot be used for quantitative analysis. Uh, so AAS is a quantitative technique because it gives us a number of, so a concentration of ions in the sample. So this, this answer is incorrect. B. AAS measures the wavelengths of light emitted when electrons fall back to their ground state. Uh, this is not true because AAS is measuring the absorbance that um, occurs in the sample from the ions. So not light emitted. So this one is also incorrect. So C. In AAS, white light is shone through a vaporized sample in order to observe which wavelengths are absorbed. Uh, this is not the case because white light is all light frequencies, but in AAS we're looking at specific frequencies 
uh, that is for the sample we're looking, uh, the ions that we're looking at. So they're only going to give us uh, a few frequencies which is specific for that ion. So it's not white light. And therefore this one is also incorrect. Uh, so D, the wavelength of light used in AAS matches one of the spectral lines produced when the sample is analysed by a flame test. Uh, this is correct because we're looking at spectral lines in the absorption spectrum. So the black bars, which are specific for the ions that we're looking for. So this answer is correct. So what we looked at is that AAS is a technique that uses absorption of light, not the emittance of light. So question two, what is the purpose of the light source and the flame in the figure? So to answer this question, we need to determine what's the question word, and that is what. And we need to answer two parts. So we need to answer why we need a light source and also why we have the flame. So first of all, we'll look at the light source. The light source provides the characteristic emission spectrum of the element being analysed. And then the flame provides the heat that we need to vaporise the sample being analysed so that light can pass through it. So what we need to make sure is that we answer both parts of the question. So question three. Which of the following substances is best analysed by the AAS technique? B, iodine. Uh, iodine is not used for the AAS technique because it's not a metal ion. So this one is incorrect. C, nitrogen. Nitrogen is not, also not a metal, so it's not used to, uh, not, AAS is not used for this one, so it's also incorrect. And silicon, for the same reason, because it's not a heavy metal ion. Oh, it's not a metal ion. So it's incorrect. And A, calcium. Calcium is a metal ion, and therefore we can use AAS to determine concentrations in the sample. So calcium is correct. Uh, AAS is important to note that it's only for metal ions, not other elements. So question four. How does the flame in atomic absorption spectrum help to determine metal ions present in a sample. So the question word here is how? And we need to look at the flame again. And how does this allow us to determine metal ions in the sample? So the flame vaporises the sample so then we can have light passing through it. Light energy from the flame Vaporise as a small part of it to be gaseous, again to be, so then light can pass through it and then the atoms can absorb the light. So in question five, I already circled the question word, why? But we also have two other ones in this one, why, when, and by whom? Was the AAS uh, technique developed? So first of all, why? It, we needed a quantitative method to analyse and determine low concentrations of metal ions in samples. When? It was in 1950. And by whom? Sir Alan Walsh and his colleagues at the CSIRO in Sydney developed this technique. So in summary, we looked at AAS and how it works. So a light is passed through a sample and then absorption occurs and we can look at the absorption to determine the amount of uh, metal ions in the sample. And this has a variety of applications because it is sensitive and it allows us to look at very low concentrations. So this means we can look at micronutrients, we can look at trace elements and we can look at say pollutants in the waterways and in the soil. So in the, that was what we did in this lesson. And in the next lesson, we'll be looking at uh, the content of sulfate in fertilizers. So I'll see you in the next lesson.